Artaxius had completed the Armenian Revolution by placing a blade through their former King of Kings, Antiochus of the Seleucid Empire. There was still work to be done securing a buffer between Armenia and the Empire, and that work was being complicated by the actions of Esar Haddon, a newly appointed general with ambitions greater than simply driving the Seleucids beyond sight of the Armenian plateau. Tell me of his dreams and ambitions. You say he is dedicated to a free Armenia, but that can't be it. Esar Haddon is a little older than the students I'm used to, but his temperament remains quite idealistic. He certainly wants Armenia to remain free. I mean, I don't really know what an Armenian is, but he is one, there's no doubt of that. His vision aligns with mine, then. It may well do. But then again, I might cynically point out that he is of minor nobility at best. This whole thing has catapulted him to fame, and I dare say he would enjoy keeping things that way. But which general can that not be said of, in this age or any? He will be a fine leader, thanks to me, anyway. You think he aspires to be royalty? Oh, well, to the extent that all do. I doubt he has a dagger for your back, as it stands was thinking about it another way, actually. I am the last man of the Arontid line still alive. You're of the Arontid line, are you? First I've heard of it. Won't be the last, unless you don't keep quiet, master. Point is, I will need to expand the dynasty through legal means. Let him know that if he impresses me sufficiently, I will make him a prince. Should I say it in all seriousness, or with room to pretend that I was joking later? Given that I'm not sure which style I intend to be practicing right now, I think it's best left down to your judgment. Hello there and welcome back to Wings of Eden. We've just got a new war declared on us, or declared on our client state I should say, and it's my own ally that I created, the second Nabatian faction. They're attacking Colchis for some reason. Maybe this is revenge for the fact I refused to marry Artaxius' daughter to the king of Nabatia. I'm going to join with Colchis. The upside is that Nabatia doesn't really have much in terms of a military or anything really, just one unit I think, so we'll be okay. Looks like that the daughter who possibly caused this war is trying to elope with some random governor or general from the Armenian court. We're going to prevent that because we may be able to use her for a political marriage at some point. Now back to the Antiochia situation. The army that was defending this area has sailed away out through the docks, meaning it's just a small garrison now holding the city, so we might as well take this opportunity to storm the walls while they're only lightly defended. We had a great advantage as the battle started because for some reason I could deploy my siege towers right next to the wall at one point in particular so I'll focus my attack on that section of the enemy defences. Meanwhile the defenders are hanging out in another section of the city which is quite disconnected from where I'm attacking. This means we'll be able to take a decent part of the wall completely uncontested. At the same time, the enemy do have two ships out at sea, and my cavalry have been sent to deal with that threat. First I tried shooting fire arrows at the ships, but the amount of fire damage this does is minimal, so we'd be here all day actually trying to set fire to the enemy craft. They do have a scorpion on their deck, but they weren't firing at us, so that was good. Eventually the crew of this ship landed and routed as they deployed. That's effectively going to be the end of them because we can just run them down later. But I'm still going to hide my cav as if this is a threat because I don't want the other ship to see me. It's got a ballista on it. Right now they're not even paying any attention, but if they did start firing that could be trouble. So I'll hide for a bit. Now capturing the walls proved to be quite difficult because while we can get up here we can't go down the towers or at least not all of our men can go down the towers. A large portion of our troops chose to run to a different tower in order to get into the city. Not sure what's up with that, but it meant our units were now really spread out and generally obliterated, which wreaks havoc on the AI of your own units and the individual men in the units and causes all sorts of weird effects. 
The enemy are still hanging out in a different portion of the city, not doing much, but they are reacting to my advance, they're coming to defend their victory point as a few of my guys start to get there. The ship with that ballista on it eventually landed its crew, and my horse archers can just reveal themselves from the undergrowth to cut all of those men down. The main fight is about to begin, as the enemy move some high pacifists to challenge my capturing of the victory point. There's a nice choke point here, so we can stop them getting to the victory point for a bit, but obviously this is enemy heavy infantry facing my levies. We're completely out of formation, half the unit's somewhere else. Overall, it's just about the worst possible matchup we could expect here, and our unit routes quite quickly. Routes in a weird direction, and it glitches out quite a lot, so a lot of those men will die attempting to flee the city because they'll just flee back into the enemy. Meanwhile, other units are sitting on the capture point in a sort of splintered fashion, bits of other units I should say, and they don't stand any chance either, meaning we have to run, we have to cancel a plan to capture this victory point and just try and draw the enemy back towards our supporting forces. Said forces are taking their time about entering the city. We've got lots of problems. It seems that just about every unit has glitched out on the way up the siege towers. Our men are just defiantly standing there. But over time, soldiers did gradually filter up and occupy the walls. The plan was to then draw those hypaspists towards our javelineers and archers to kill them from above. But the AI was quite smart. It didn't follow me back over there once it saw my men and ended up returning back towards its original position. So fine, we haven't killed them, but we're not out of options yet. Now that we're deploying everything, we'll soon be able to make a more organized assault. At the same time, I discovered that the northern gates of the city aren't gates at all. The beaches where our cavalry were are actually exposed to the interior of the city. You can just run in here from that angle. We didn't need to do all that siege tower stuff at all. So, as you can see, SR Haddon gets in there with his cataphracts to attack some of the enemy's low-level spears. We can't really stick around for those fights, especially with javelins and arrows coming at us, so I get out of there. The problem we have is that the pathfinding in this city is messed up. You saw the lag there a second ago. Whenever I gave a cavalry unit an order, it lagged out a lot, trying to work out paths in some difficult fashion. And Esarhaddon ran half of his men into a wall and got many of them killed. We have captured the second victory point. There are two on this map for us to get, so we've got the one that's further away. And now our men are finally establishing themselves inside the city, so we're ready to get serious about taking that first victory point again. If they really were preparing a trap, they'll spring it now, once we're all over the walls. From what we've seen, though, I think it was a bluff. They didn't leave the gates open to draw us in. They just didn't have the faintest idea what they're doing. Same goes for the towers. Or perhaps they were sticking to that old line, Men shall be our walls. We'll see what a lance pierces better, of stone or flesh. Now, given that all of Macarese's old boys claimed that taking Antiochia would be impossible, this feat should place me in good standing with the king. He turns princes and kings away from his court like beggars, but if there's anything that impresses him, it's honest Armenian men taking back a measure of what these foreigners stole from us. Horses, coin, grain, and pride. Not even the ghost of Alexander himself can hold us back today. Once everything was set up, the enemy sent one very depleted unit to attack the second victory point. I've got some levies and horse archers defending it, the archers pepper the enemy as they come in, and now we'll just leave these guys to slap at each other. Both units are tired, so they're unlikely to actually damage each other very much. We'll just wait for our cavalry to go rear flank those spearmen and then that will be a victory. The enemy probably could have benefited from bringing over their archers to fire at the victory point and whittle me down, but right now the archers are busy. They're shooting at some of my archers in fact, but my archers have found pretty good cover. They've somehow got underground. I think the siege towers glitched out so much that one of my units went down instead of up. And now they're under the map, just wandering around and drawing enemy fire. So that's a pretty helpful glitch. 
Eventually, the enemy's high pacifists came to attack the main victory point as before, but this time we're ready for them. Not only do we have lots more troops blocking the enemy path, but we can bring over some skirmishers to throw jabs into the back of the enemy. Since the enemy ran here, they're tired, and as we've said before, that for some reason makes you more vulnerable to ranged attacks, so these javelins should do the work. They still have quite high stats, you can see it takes multiple javelins to kill one of these guys, they're very hardy, but slowly but surely we should be able to bring them down. The deal is eventually sealed when Esar Haddon shows up with the cataphracts to rear attack the high pacifists. They rout in the face of this move and that's going to bring the battle to an end, we were about to win anyway, on victory point so the enemy's few remaining units couldn't have done anything. A decisive victory and easier than expected, I expected it to be quite easy because of the enemy's scant defences, but they were even weaker than I thought, lots of glitches in our favour in this battle, especially with all of the towers on the map being completely defunct, they were just fake. We are able to liberate a faction here, so that's what we like to see. Something like Macedonian Tetropolis, some strange successor, successor state faction. So we'll give it to them, and there we go. Now we've got an ally here on the coast, we've further expanded our buffer, and Esar Haddon has won glory. As for what he'll do next, I'm not quite sure. We could move to the northwest to attack the next Antiochia, the other Antiochia that the Seleucids have, but for now I started moving him back towards our own territory. The new Tetropolis faction we've created immediately causes trouble, because in their first turn they declare war on the Ptolemaic Kingdom for some reason, and now I have to choose which side I want to take. Ultimately I'm going to take the Ptolemaic Kingdom side, because that is the far superior choice, so we're immediately back at war with Antiochia, we didn't make much progress there it seems. They send a few units against us, ordinarily we'd be able to take them down, but it turns out there was also a hidden Seleucid army in the forest, near the road, that we avoided being ambushed by before I guess, and they joined the battle, so I have to withdraw there. Looks like Esarhaddon really is being sent back to square one. Antiochia is now more heavily defended than it was before he took it. The situation has actually worsened, we'll have to keep working on that. Now a bit of good news, the war against Nabatia comes to a peaceful end because they agreed to surrender and be our puppet state. So overall the war went well, before they were just our ally, now we've got some free money off them and they're a client state so they'll have to give us tribute in the future. The business is settled, and the tribute arranged for, O oh, King of Kings. Yes, yes, enough of that. I did have a little more, if you'll indulge me. It's about Esar Haddon. Isn't it about time you recalled him? No, he's popular and skilled. I mean from Antiochia, that whole area. The army should return to Armenia to protect it. Out there he's playing conqueror, and playing it poorly given the situation with the Tetropolis. He's showing everyone that the Seleucids can be defeated, there's value in that. But we've already done that, we've won Artaxius. Now is the time to rest the men, see to our borders and focus on building unity in Armenia itself. The tribes need their king at home. There is too much to attend to on the borders, you know that. The vassals are at each other's throats, and there are more people asking to be free from the Empire. Things aren't set right yet. You are not just the king of the tribes now, are you? What is your point? Oh, king of kings, I have no point at all, of course. The war with Tetropolis was also ended peacefully, because they were willing to be my puppet state as well. I did have to give them a whole load of money to avoid fighting them, but we do have a whole load of money, we have a massive income and nothing to spend it on, so just buying more client states is a worthy investment. I can even get some of the money back right away by selling them a trade deal afterwards, which they'll quite like, since we have so much stuff. After that, a new war started, when the Armenian nobles decided to declare war on Nabatia, our newly made client state. Perhaps they disagreed with us forcing them to surrender, they want to invade. Doesn't really matter which side we pick here, because both of them are just one region. But I decided to go for Nabatia, because not only are they my client state, which is a closer deal than an alliance, they're my puppet state I should be saying, 
but by conquering the Armenian nobles I'm taking territory that within my rules I'm allowed to occupy. A battle started right away, some random Armenian noble was wandering around, and a Nabatian noble went to fight him, bringing my whole army into support, so that was a victory. Then Esarhaddon can jump over to Amida and attack, we'll lay siege here and start making the relevant siege equipment. The enemy army is the same as ours but worse, so that's a good situation. But also we do have our Taxius' army nearby, fresh from its victory against that one guy. So he can come and join the siege, in particular he's got a ballista, which will be very useful for Esarhaddon to have. There was one other concern, we saw for a second there, that the Armenian nobles have gone and taken Ekbatana from media at Pretene. they must have done it in that end turn sequence, so we can't completely destroy their faction by just taking their capital here, but we'll do it anyway. So I'm going to transfer the ballista into Esar Haddon's force, this allows him to auto resolve the assault right now without siege equipment, and because we now have two armies standing around that's just an overwhelming win. We'll move on in then and occupy, so we now have all of the territory that I'm allowed to occupy within my own rules. Again, it's a case where it's one region in a province, so it's hard to hold it down and make sure it doesn't rebel or run out of food or something in Attila's annoying economy system. We were lucky though, this place is actually pretty stable and somehow is able to keep its food supply up even without any food making buildings. Not quite sure what's going on here, but it looks good, <laughs> so we don't need to micromanage this place too much and overhaul the buildings or anything. As for Ekbatana, I found I could actually make another puppet state right here. I could even ask them for money, but because they were so poor, they couldn't give me very much money. That's a shame. I'll take everything they have then and get the puppet state deal. There we have it. This has the side effect of breaking up the province of Media Antipatene, and meaning that the faction Media Antipatene doesn't control all of it or can't control all of it if they eventually went on to attack Raga to the east, as I've been waiting for them to do for a while. Seems a bit mean since we're all about having people control their own territory, but this is just the way things have gone. Now Armenia actually overlooks Media Antipatene by holding the capital of their region. We get a military alliance offer from the Ptolemaic Kingdom. I was hesitant at first to take it, but the ruler, Ptolemaeus V, is a really nice guy. He's just got all the positive traits for a ruler. So I thought that being in that alliance might actually be a good idea. He's more likely to help us than to force us to go on some random campaigns for him or anything. We notice that the Seleucid Empire are now besieging our newly made puppet state, Tetropolis, so Esarhaddon is going to immediately destroy the ballistas that Artaxius gave him in order to allow his army to move faster. I'll take on some mercenary warriors because we're lacking in melee infantry, and now we'll go to try and relieve this siege right away. I think we do need to do this in this turn because there's pretty much nothing inside the city so once the enemy make one ladder they'll just auto resolve their way in. So we arrive in time, as you can see there's really not much there to help us out but having those extra units appear on the flank of the enemy army will be useful. So yes it's time for our first set piece battle against a proper Seleucid army. And when Antilochus gets the Phalangites to turn, we advance the cavalry down the right flank to release their arrows into their unshielded side. That's it. A perfect strategy. Are you sure this is your first time fighting Seleucids, young man? Their weakness is clear if you think about it. Don't need to have done it before. Ah, the power of thought. Lost on our age, I say. Yet not always necessary. Our king was never that good at military studies. He was more adept for a life as an engineer, I always thought. That Sin Sharish Kun was always railing people up though, and the whole class entered politics. Antiochus was delighted, getting a nice batch of new generals and bureaucrats to play with. But an empire of politicians can never be one empire only, not for long. Ah, the age of the philosopher kings is long past indeed. I have to go, sir. Will that be all? Yes, sorry. You, my boy, are now well beyond my tuition. I'll leave the battle and the nation in your good hands. Remember the king's offer well. He means it. You're leaving? Retiring. The king has offered me a lovely estate on a new colony by the Caspian. I shall sit there and await the day another of my students becomes king, eh? 
Thanks, Master. I owe everything to you. Yes, I know. Quite the weight in gold, actually. Would you like to discuss how we're going to pay for my services? The battle is starting. I really have to go. Go on, then. <laughs> Seems like I've made a philosopher and a politician all in one. Once our formations are close together, the enemy advance towards us. They're leading with loads of skirmishers, slingers in particular. I was okay with that. I thought a skirmish might go well because we have loads of archers. However, the enemy didn't want to skirmish. Their cavalry charge forwards, and I do a not particularly good job of receiving them, actually. I didn't pull the archers backwards quickly enough, and they weren't on skirmish mode. So some of them got hit by the enemy charge. But for the most part, the enemy cav were stuck in amongst our spearmen, and that's what we want. More cav were coming around our right flank, but that's where I had all of the horse archers, so they'll just skirmish away and gradually whittle those cav down. They are going to try and repeat their charges in the center, but the line is all established now. We've got our spearmen ready. So we'll just wait for a melee to break out. Many of the enemy's units are similar to mine in that they're levy spears, so it's fine to just let these melees go on without paying them much attention. But then again, they do have some heavier units in amongst them, such as phalangites, and perhaps more importantly, these silver shields, the Hellenistic answer to Roman legionaries. They're heavy infantry that will just hack through our troops. There are some Galatian mercenaries in there as well, which are quite good in melee too. Our levies don't really have a way to kill these silver shields, so we just have to hold on, try not to die too quickly, and buy time for us to do maneuvers behind the enemy's army and try and get something going. One thing I did do is send SR Haddon right to the back of the enemy's force, because they had so many slingers attacking us we needed to get rid of them. And just piling into them like this was actually much more effective than I expected. Usually when you send one or two cav against a huge cloud of skirmishers, the skirmishers will just shoot at the cav at close range and kill them. But they all started skirmishing away, several units routed on contact, and we did actually drive them away from the battle. That's great, because now that frees up our skirmishers to start hitting the enemy's heavy infantry, in particular their slow-moving pike units, who are yet to engage in many cases. My horse archers were freed up on the right, so they could come over and help out with the skirmishers, just driving them completely off the map and attacking routing units so that they don't return to the fight. As for our allied forces, here's what they were doing. <laughs> They attacked two blocks of pikemen who were standing on top of each other from the front, just the worst possible thing they could have done. Their cavalry are sitting on the edge of the map, I don't know what they're doing, they're just being generally terrible. But at least those pikemen aren't attacking us, that's something. Our skirmishing attack has routed one unit of enemy pikes, that's good to see. But things aren't going especially well in the main line. Here they've even got some pikes actually attacking my spearmen from the front, and that's going to be sort of nasty. <laughs> At least they're mostly out of position, they're not attacking us very well. We need to rear attack these guys, and that's exactly what I do. The horse archers are now freed up after scaring off all the enemy skirmishers, so we hit the pikes from behind with a light cavalry charge. Doesn't do that much, it's not going to shock them or make them rout or anything, but now that they're fighting well surrounded, they'll start to lose their nerve. I lost one of my units in the center, but I had one reserve unit that could get stuck in there and try and hold the line to buy us some more time. Now SR Haddon's going to try and make a charge with his cataphracts. I hit the back of the enemy commander's unit, some high pacifists. I expected this to be more effective than it was. It didn't actually do very much. I think it's because the cataphracts are now tired since they spent all that time charging after the other units. They lose a lot of the impact of their charge. Things go well over here on our right, though I finally rout one of the pike units we had surrounded just as it was routing the infantry it was fighting. So we'll get rid of those guys and then we'll free up more cavalry for me to keep charging with. Under repeated charges and missile fire, especially from the foot archers who I put behind the enemy's army at this point, one of the pike units routes and that chain routes the rest of the army due to army losses perfect since we were really struggling to actually kill some of their heavy infantry. As long as the Seleucids don't field too many, we're okay. It's a decisive victory, a nice set-piece field battle that all went very well. We didn't lose any units, even though our levies did get smashed up a little bit, participating in those melees. Our allies got annihilated because they used their men so poorly, but that's okay. The enemy lost a few units, and the units they have left are in terrible condition, so they'll have to sit in their own territory for a 
while we've probably bought some safety, perhaps more importantly we've bought some glory for SR Haddon, and perhaps the opportunity to actually go and attack the other Antiochia now if there's no other army nearby. That is it for now, thank you very much for watching and special thanks to all of the officially Devon patrons. We'll be moving on to challenge the final part of our victory objective in the next episode of Wings of Eden.